Good evening. How's everyone tonight? My name is Larry Falcon. Uh, I'm here with uh, April Mason, and we will be doing our um, event uh, this evening in regards to uh, backcountry touring and uh, how easy and uh, safely it is to get involved with. Now, I wish you were all here tonight that you could be sitting in front of us. Always a lot more fun, but due to COVID, of course, we can't do that. So we're very fortunate that there's only three of us in here tonight. I'm going to take the mask off because we're all safely distanced and uh, we won't be requiring it. So first off, welcome. Secondly, can you guys all hear me? If you can't, if you wouldn't mind just uh, typing uh, into the chat function of Zoom, just to let us know if you've got problems with our hearing, and then we'll make necessary adjustments if necessary in that respect. But first and foremost, thank you all for joining us. I think you'll find this evening being uh, very um, interesting. I think you'll learn an awful lot, and I really hope that uh, you'll allow us to guide you into becoming very safe tours in the backcountry. As I commented, my name is Larry Falcon. I've been involved with the escape route now for 10 years, and I've been a backcountry enthusiast for, oh, I guess almost 40 years now. That sounds like a long time, but I started early. You know, I was very fortunate. I was uh, boot packing my way around Whistler uh, while I was uh, well into my uh, early teens and continued that into touring. And here I am today talking with you and over that whole period of time, I've been in the backcountry. Not once have I been involved in a slide. And I'm happy to say because of decisions that you make while you're in the backcountry. We'll talk more about that as we go through this evening's presentation to you. It's a little different talking to a camera. You know, normally, it's nice to have people in front because you get excellent feedback. So please feel free through the chat function. If uh, you you need a clarification on something, oh, you'll just do uh, pipe away, and we'll go from there. So, want to get started? You know, the escape route has been in business for 30 years. This is our 30th year, which is quite an accomplishment when you consider that that's in Whistler, which is a very difficult town to establish a successful business. We're very fortunate tonight to be doing this in collaboration with the Mountain Skills Academy. I'll sometimes reference them as MSA. Mountain Skills Academy has also been around for a long time uh, through uh, previous uh, versions of their organization. They've been involved in getting people out into the backcountry for almost as long as we've been in business as well. So it's really nice to have them involved tonight. And I know what you'll hear from uh, April will be very positive. So, you know, I don't want to spend too much time in the introduction here, but uh, I do want to let you know that uh, our goal tonight is to allow you to understand and easily comprehend how you can get involved in the backcountry without spending a lot of money. You certainly can, but it's not necessary. And we're very fortunate. I mentioned uh, April Mason. Uh, she's going to uh, come on right now. I'll talk a little bit later more about our fabulous gear that you might need to get into the backcountry. But I want to mention uh, April because uh, she's been involved um, for quite some time in the backcountry. Association. She's an active member with the instructor with the Canadian um, uh, Snowboard uh, Instructors Association. She's a trained medical responder in non-urban emergency uh, care. And for the past seven years, she's lived and played in uh, the Sea to Sky Corridor, presently in Emmerda. Very lucky. April's been with MSA for four years, and she's uh, been an active member with the Avalanche, or sorry, in giving the Avalanche skills training through MSA. Uh, she instructs regularly the intro to backcountry skiing through uh, MSA as well. And last year, uh, she founded, started uh, Women's uh, Backcountry Series, which is a means of um, getting women involved in the backcountry through a mentorship, knowledge, and safe uh, aspect to it. So without further ado, I would like to introduce April Mason. 
And please, you'll give her a big round of applause, even though we won't be able to hear it, but she certainly deserves it. April, over to you. Awesome. Hi, guys. Can everybody hear me? Can I get a thumbs up from somebody? Yeah, perfect. All right. Um, so I'm going to share my screen here with you guys. You're going to have to bear with me. I'm not awesome at this stuff, but I'm going to get better. Okay. So there we go. Awesome. So again, like Larry said, my name is April. I've been working with MSA for quite a few years now. I've been in the backcountry for almost a decade now, which is a lot less than I can say for a lot of people in this town, but I've learned a lot in that time. Um, tonight, I've been asked to speak to you guys about backcountry skiing and about how to get started. So I guess the best place to start is to let you guys know how I got started. And I suppose learn from the lessons that I uh, learned quite poorly. Um, so backcountry skiing for me, I started in Chamonix in the Alps um, about nine years ago. And my take on it was shut up, follow, and don't ask questions. And I can tell you that was the wrong approach to take. I ended up in a lot of not very pleasant situations and learned a lot of lessons the hard way. Since then, um, backcountry skiing has definitely evolved for me. It's evolved into a pursuit of being able to move in the backcountry summer and winter to traverse from mountain range to mountain range, um, hopefully effortlessly and with a competency that will keep you safe. Um, that is not an easy thing to do. And I will be working the rest of my life at doing that. I can tell you that much. Three things that I can tell you that backcountry skiing has done for me. Um, it's provided me a sense of mental wellness. I like to say that I am the best version of myself when I'm in the backcountry, when I'm seeing beautiful things and I'm able to experience, um, you know, that, that, pureness with everybody else that's around me. It has offered me fitness for sure, uh, both the goal and the result it seems to be. Um, it's really hard to walk up a mountain without being in good shape and the first time that you do you will learn that yeah it's time to kick your butt into action to get there. And last but not least um, a sense of exploration. My goal um, here living in the coast has been to have a thorough knowledge of all of the mountains within an hour of where I can, of where I live, where I can drive. Um, that is to say that if I was on a particular mountain in a particular drainage somewhere that without a map and a compass, I would know by landmarks what direction I could go to get home again. Um, I'm still working on that pursuit and I think a lot of people are. There's some questions that we're going to address here tonight. Um, and I think that's the main theme is that when you get started in backcountry skiing, you have a lot of questions. And the very first one seems to be, what gear do I need? Um, there is an endless list. And as your skills evolve and as your pursuits become more complex, that list of gear will become more in depth as well. Um, tonight, we're gonna start with the basics and try and get you guys to understand, you know, an easy way to, to transition into the backcountry. So first and foremost, uh, touring equipment. Larry is going to talk in depth about some of these things um, a little bit later on when I'm done my part of the presentation, but I wanna get just a basic list out there so that you guys can have a look. So touring equipment, skis, split boards, skins, poles, boots, repair kit, technical backpack and ski crampons. In a lot of people's mind, that's kind of it. Um, but the list definitely does go on from there. Avalanche rescue equipment, shovel, probe, and transceiver. Keep in tune, and we're going to be giving away a shovel and probe a little bit later on today. Um, a comprehensive first aid kit does not have to be carried by everyone in your party, but must be carried by every party. So please keep that in mind. And we live in BC, we live in the Northern Hemisphere. It gets dark here in December around four o'clock in the afternoon. So I would encourage you to always keep a headlamp and spare batteries with you everywhere that you're going. Um, there are two things on this screen that currently have asterisks, that's repair kit and first aid kit. These are the two things that I find most lacking in the people that I go touring with in the backcountry. If you own a split board or if you own a pair of touring skis, you should have the basic tools and the basic hardware to repair that in the backcountry. 
Um, I'm going to be definitely talking a little bit more about this as we move through the presentation, but I just wanted to get that out there. All right, what else do we have? Technical clothing, that's a big investment as well. Base layers, mid layers, ski socks, Gore-Tex, gloves. Okay, all of these things will cost some money, but I'll show you how we can cheat that system a little bit, okay? We also need to think about our navigation equipment. Map compass is the basics, but it is, you know, modern times and GPS, a phone, and even a battery pack is something that is gonna be really useful to you in the backcountry. Do not rely on other people for navigation. This is something that you should be adapting into your skill set, and we're going to talk about that as well. Last but not least, one that a lot of people tend to forget, um, transportation. I work in the summertime in wildfire, and we say that one of the most dangerous things we do is driving to and from the fire, and there is no exception for backcountry skiing. Trying to drive the Duffy Lake Pass on a snowy morning with four inches of snow on the road is as dangerous as anything that you're going to do in the backcountry. So keep that in mind. All right, now this is my advice. That was a long list. Research, budget, rent, and buy. Let's start from the beginning. What is right for somebody is not right for everybody. I have been given a lot of advice over the years about what to buy and what's going to make my life easier. I have at times heeded that advice and paid the price, okay? There is tons of information available online. There's all sorts of lists that will tell you, this is the top 20 scoot touring skis of 2020, okay? Read those lists, research it more, talk to people, read reviews, and do the due diligence that you should do in spending that amount of money. The next piece of advice is budget, okay? You will not likely be able to afford to buy that entire list new from a store. You need to figure out what's gonna be most valuable to you. My advice would be start with the boots and then establish a list and a price point that's gonna suit your budget, okay? Um, not a lot of us are working full time anymore and disposable income is hard to come by and every single one of us wants to get out into the mountains so do it consciously and think about where you can save a few dollars one of those places is renting first okay if you have questions about split boards or touring skis or backcountry boots if you're not sure what's going to work for you rent first the wonderful thing about renting from the escape route is that the money that you've spent on your rental, they will take off the price of new equipment, okay? So if you've rented a pair of touring skis two, three, four times, whatever it is, they'll accumulate all of that money and give you that discount on a brand new pair. Last but not least, we do have to buy. Um, not everything can be found in used stores and through friends. So like I said, use that budget that you've put together Pick the high priced items and see where you can save a few dollars. And if in doubt, come into the store, come to the office and talk to people where you can help save a few dollars. So that's the gear. The next question that a lot of us seem to have is what training do I need? Now, this is possibly the most important part, okay? The four pieces of training that I would recommend you guys try and pick through over the course of the season or two Number one, avalanche safety training, okay? Number two, first aid. This cannot be left out. And then once you've established yourself in that way, crevasse rescue and navigation are two courses that you for sure should look into. So avalanche safety training, AST1, AST2. Your AST1 is a two-day course. The first day is gonna be in the classroom, learning about weather, snowpack, terrain conditions, how those factors contribute to the avalanche hazard, how to travel in the backcountry safely, mitigating those hazards, and yeah, how to ski a slope so as to cause the least amount of harm to anybody around you and to make sure that everybody is accounted for at the end of the day. Your AST2 is a four day program. It's a little bit more in depth. It's gonna teach you a little bit more about snow study, teach you how to dig a snow pit, teach you how to navigate and up track in more challenging terrain and how to lead a group, okay? AST1 is the first step you need to take. Once you've been out on your gear and you're confident with how to move on your equipment, you've got a few days in the backcountry, the AST2 is the next place to go. 
First aid training. A lot of people that I go into the backcountry with carry a first aid kit and don't have a wilderness first aid course to support it. The two courses that I recommend are the Advanced Wilderness First Aid, which is a 40-hour course or a five-day course. And the second is the Wilderness First Responder. The WFR 80 is the first course that I took um, actually after coming to BC. And to this day, I think it's one of the most valuable courses that I will take with me. It is critical to understand how to fix a problem when it arises in the backcountry, and that might not be an injury, that might be an illness as well. Crevasse rescue is the next course you need to be thinking about. Um, you know, we live in the Coast Mountains, we've got much, we've got a ton of glaciated terrain around us, and if you're going to be traveling on glaciers, it's imperative that you have an understanding of crevasse rescue. Even if you don't know how to necessarily lead a rescue, it's important that you know how to support it. It's a two-day course, that will definitely serve you in the long term. Last but not least, you need to think about navigation, okay? Um, if you have navigation experience, that's amazing, keep it up. If you don't and you still need to understand or learn how to triangulate your position in the backcountry using a map and compass, I recommend taking two days to learn these skills. MSA offers all of these courses. We're currently not offering the first aid during the winter season, but I'm going to show you guys some uh, sources here where you can get that training. Um, so first up, not going to spend a lot of time on this, AST1 AST training. These are some dates that we have coming up. December 12th and 13th is the Women's Backcountry Series AST1. I know that there's a couple spots left on that course. There's also several courses running in Whistler and Squamish throughout December, January, and into February. These are the ones that just popped up first, okay? Wilderness First Aid Training. I mentioned that MSA does offer these programs, the Wilderness First Aid um, 80 and the Wilderness First Aid 40. We're currently not offering the program during the winter season, but if you are looking for that training, this is where you can go and find it. Coast uh, Wilderness Medical Training has programs running in both Vancouver and Squamish in the coming months really truly understand that this is as important as your AST1, okay? Um, what else we got? Crevasse Rescue. Uh, so this is again a two-day course that MSA offers and these are the programs that we have scheduled. Please keep in mind that we are doing our best to accommodate the current climate right now, meaning that if you have a group of friends together and you want to book a course, you can call the MSA office or email the MSA office and we will do our absolute best to accommodate a private course. Even if the people in your group have various skill levels, we will accommodate and make sure that we're teaching to everyone in the group. Okay, now this can be said for the AST1, the AST2, the crevasse rescue, all of these courses. We're going to work with you and do our best to make sure that everybody goes into the backcountry this year with adequate training. The navigation course, uh, we don't have public courses scheduled at this point in time, but like I said, I would encourage you to call the office or email the office and we'll get something scheduled for you and your friends. Okay, now this is the real meat and potatoes. This is the question I get asked a lot. Where do I go? There are a ton of resources available online, so I'm not going to dive into that in depth. What I'm going to do is answer some pretty simple questions for you. When I think about where to go, when I teach trip planning in an AST1, there's kind of four questions that come to mind first and foremost. Okay, what's the forecast? What is the snow telling me? What terrain is appropriate for those conditions? And what risks am I putting myself into? Okay, so first, this is the avalanche triangle. In an AST1, this is the very first thing we look at, weather, terrain, and snowpack. These are the three factors that are gonna help us decide where we wanna go. The first, like I mentioned, is the forecast. Here's a couple of resources that you can use. Three of them are URLs. I trust that you guys can figure that one out. I'm gonna dive a little bit more in depth into Avalanche Canada. Okay. Avalanche Canada is a publicly funded organization, meaning your tax dollars are paying for it, so use it, that helps get the information and the training out there and make sure that the bulletin, the Avalanche Hazard Bulletin, is disseminated to everyone who needs to look for it. Okay. So what you're going to do is you're going to go to avalanche.ca, 
you're going to go to backcountry resources and you're going to click on mountain weather forecast okay what you do when you do that is you're going to find this it's going to give you a multi-tiered multi-day breakdown of what the weather is looking to do over the next couple of days in our local region and throughout bc now unless you're a weather buff they're going to use some terms that you might not be familiar with which is why they have this handy tool weather glossary on the left hand side at the bottom anything you need to know about the weather will be there broken down and easy to understand next if you don't know who this guy is research him find it out John Baldwin has put tracks across every inch of the Coast Mountains and a lot of parts of British Columbia. And he's put an easy list together, weather resources and otherwise for you guys to use. It's really easy to find this information and you gotta do it, okay? So moving on from John, there's a couple pieces of, pieces of advice I'm gonna give to you guys. Check the weather forecast daily. I don't care if you're skiing the resort, if you're staying home, whatever it is, check the forecast daily, check the avalanche bulletin daily and keep a journal. This is gonna help you understand the patterns that are evolving over time. If you neglect to check the forecast and come mid January, you decide you wanna go backcountry skiing, there's gonna be a ton of information missing, okay? Now there will be some tools that I'm gonna show you here in a second to help fix that knowledge gap, but by keeping a weather blog or a weather journal daily and an avalanche bulletin journal daily, you're going to save yourself a lot of time. The next question that I ask myself in deciding where to go is what is the snow telling me? This is not an easy question. This is something, an intuition that will evolve over your entire career in the backcountry. But I'm going to try and show you a few sources here. So again, back to avalanche.ca. When you go to avalanche.ca, this is the very first screen you're gonna see. It's British Columbia broken up into various forecast regions. Over here on the left, we have the Coast Mountains, Coast Mountain Forecast Region, sorry, Sea to Sky. And over on the right, we have the South Coast Inland. So South Coast Inland is gonna be more applicable if you're looking to tour in the Duffy or up north of Pemberton, okay? The bulletin is not currently being published, not until November 25th, which is why on the screen you're going to see those black diamonds. Over to the right of the screen, you can see that in the Rockies and across the Alberta border, they are forecasting already. You click on those icons and the bulletin is going to pop up. Now the bulletin is challenging to read if you haven't taken an avalanche course. There's going to be a lot of terminology that will be a little bit mystifying to you. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to go to avalanche.ca. We're going to click on learn and then we're going to click on glossary okay another piece of information to help fill those gaps in the glossary they will have every complex avalanche or weather term broken down easy for you to understand including diagrams and links to other sources please 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 use these resources to your advantage okay now in the bulletin as well um when you click on that, that diamond and you get the colors and the terminology and all of the avalanche problems that are present that day, there is something missing, okay? And that is the history. Like I said, if you've taken an avalanche um, hazard journal or a weather journal over the course of the season, you're gonna be able to fill in those gaps about what's been happening up until that time. But let's say for instance, I want, whoop, wrong screen, whoop, wrong screen. Let's say, for instance, I want to go to Revelstoke and I haven't skied in Revelstoke and the travel bans have been lifted and we want to go skiing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to avalanche.ca, click on backcountry resources and then click on this little gem, forecast archive. The forecast archive is going to give you every avalanche bulletin for every forecast region in British Columbia for years up until this point. Okay, so if you arrive in another forecast region into the season, go to forecast archive and scroll back through the bulletins and you'll be able to establish a pattern. The next piece of information that's available to you on this wonderfully publicly funded website is this. Okay, so these are the user input trip reports. 
So on the map here, you can see that I've selected a little blue icon. I can see that it's on the uh, northwest corner of Garibaldi Lake. And the information at the top indicates to me that this trip report was submitted by CAM on November 21st on the south face of Black Tusk. What this trip report tells me is that they observed wind loading on southeast slopes in the Alpine with approximately 50 centimeters of snowpack. 80 centimeters of snowpack existed in the meadows with a crust down about 25 centimeters. This is good information to understand what the composition of the snowpack is, but what this means for your avalanche hazard will come with your avalanche safety training course. Okay, we're going to spend an entire day understanding the composition of the snowpack, the weather that contributes to that layer formation, and how the la these layers can become a hazard to us. Okay, so that's a lot of looking at websites. I understand that. The next question that we're going to talk about um, is what terrain is appropriate. So, um, what terrain is appropriate? for somebody that is just starting out is actually a really simple question, okay? You are looking for simple terrain. Now this is an official definition. It's called the Avalanche Terrain Exposure Scale. This definition of simple terrain helps us understand that we can go into the backcountry and we can use backcountry terrain and simply by the choice of that terrain help minimize our exposure. So what are you looking for? You're looking for low angle terrain. You're looking for primarily forested terrain, meaning you're probably not gonna be skiing big open alpine slopes. Avalanches are possible in this low angle terrain. Avalanches are possible in any terrain. But what this definition tells me is that in simple terrain, avalanches are infrequent. And there's many places that I can go to reduce or eliminate my exposure from this hazard. So what does simple terrain look like? It looks like this, okay? Low angle, primarily forested terrain, lots of places where I can learn to set up tracks, where I can get used to my equipment, where I can dig preliminary pits if I want to with somebody else. Lots of places where I can hang out and have lunch and I will not be affected by avalanches, okay? This is where you're gonna start. It will get more challenging the issue of where to go will become more challenging as you move on in your backcountry career, okay? We're gonna use the questions that we discussed earlier to help assess that terrain. Okay, what are the risks? There are many of them, okay? My intention is not to scare you guys. My intention is to talk to you guys about some of the things that I've encountered and some of the things that get overlooked by people that I tour with. Here is what I call my holy shit haiku. Equipment will break, people will break, shit happens. If you remember this throughout your backcountry career, you're gonna be okay. And it typically goes in this order. The number one thing that I encounter in the backcountry, the number one problem that I have when I'm teaching classes is equipment failures whether that's a skin that doesn't stick or a tail clip that broke or my binding won't go on because it's jammed with ice, whatever it is, equipment failures will happen. I once had a buddy walk six kilometers out of a backcountry zone because he lost the small pin for his split board touring piece. Had he had some hockey tape with him or some duct tape, at very least, he would have been shuffling out of the backcountry rather than post holing in about a foot and a half of snow. Okay, so what are some of the problems that we're going to encounter? Avalanche hazard, weather, injury, illness, equipment failure, terrain hazards, don't even get me started, there are too many to list, wildlife, navigation errors, difficulties in access and egress, and group conflict. Group conflict is one that also gets overlooked. I have been put in difficult situations before because of a disagreement amongst my group. Now, this is just a list. I'm not gonna pretend that this is gonna offer you any wisdom on how to avoid these hazards. What I'm trying to do is encourage you guys to assess the hazards that are present and come take a course, <laughs> okay? so. Some of the things that I like to consider 
when I'm assessing where to go or what needs to be done to ensure my safety or the safety of my group is as follows. First of all, you have to know the risks. So that list that I put together on the previous screen, you have to make a formal list during your trip plan and write down what you expect to encounter or the things that you could possibly encounter over that time. The process of writing out a trip plan or typing out a trip plan, I cannot stress how important that is. It's something that we teach in the AST1 and it's something that I do every single day when I go into the backcountry. I keep my book with me, I write down the problems that I feel I'm gonna come into, the plans that I have, the issues that I could potentially run into and how I plan to deal with them. So know the risks and do your rescue practice, okay? That is something that I encourage not only every season, but several times a season. There's a lot of people that take their AST1, get a sort of confidence from that and move into the backcountry. Your AST1 is comprised of about three hours of in-depth rescue practice, which is not enough, okay? Meaning that once you've done your AST1, it's important a few weeks out to get together with your friends, practice again. A few months out, practice again. The next season, practice again. Communications plan. Um, this is one that I take very personally. It's, you know, 2020. And I believe that going into the backcountry without the ability to communicate and call out for help is unreasonable. Um, that's great when you're valley side and you have your cell phone next to you. But if you're traveling up in the Duffy, you lose service the moment that you climb that hill into the mountain pass. And if you don't have a way to reach out for help, a very simple problem can become life threatening very quickly. So there's lots of devices out there that will allow you to connect your cell phone via satellite. Um, if you're looking for a more comprehensive device like a Garmin inReach, for instance, that will allow you to navigate as well, that's wonderful. Um, but please, please, please consider that you must have a communication plan when you're out in the backcountry because things will happen. And sometimes those things are simple and can be resolved with a roll of duct tape. And other times, you know, you might be talking about a broken arm or a broken leg. First aid, um, not only having the training, but having the equipment with you. Uh, realistically, every group traveling in the backcountry should have a first aid kit that will allow you to sling a dislocated shoulder or spl splint a broken arm. Um, yeah, there's a lot of problems that we're going to run into. My first aid kit uh, right now, I believe it weighs just shy of two pounds. Um, and I've never, I haven't felt the limit of it quite yet. So, so that's good, but I also haven't run into a ton of problems. Um, having an evacuation plan, or at very least having an appreciation for where you are in the backcountry and the intricacies of what an evacuation might look like is very important. Sometimes your evacuation plan might be dragging your body from the other side of flute back up to a point where you can be rescued. Other times your evacuation plan is going to be a lot more challenging. Um, if it's 2.30, 3 o'clock in the afternoon and you're skiing off of Caillou shoulder and it's late December, early January, there's a very good chance you have less than an hour of light left. Okay, maybe two hours of light left. That makes a rescue infinitely more complicated and means that ultimately with a severe injury or something of that nature, you're going to need to be prepared to spend the night. Um, last but not least, one of the things on my checklist is well-being. Um, personal, physical, and mental well-being is something that is extremely important when you're in the backcountry. What I mean by that is that your ability to make decisions if you are hungry, dehydrated, tired, or cold is impaired. And by impaired, I mean, yes, it's as bad as drunk driving. If you have only slept a few hours that night and you haven't had enough to eat and you're already reaching dehydration and like I mentioned it might be three o'clock in the afternoon and your friend gets hurt yeah, your ability to help them out is going to be reduced so always always protect your well-being and if you are going into the backcountry with people and you're not at your best I would recommend letting them know that good touring partners are going to help you out and keep an eye out for you okay 
Uh, who should I go with? This is probably the number one question that I get, to be quite honest. Um, for people starting out, it's challenging. It is really challenging because a lot of people will not go into the backcountry with you unless you've done basic rescue training, unless you've taken an AST1 and you've demonstrated those competencies. So my best piece of advice on who you should go with is the most experienced, knowledgeable and passionate person willing to go with you. Simple, right? Not so much, okay. So how are you gonna convince these people that do have experience and knowledge to offer to go with you? I took some time, did some research, tried to be very witty about the whole thing, but ultimately I came across something online that I think summed up everything that I needed to say. There was an article um, from Teton Gravity Research a few years ago called Five Ways to Be a Great Backcountry Ski Partner. And they hit the nail on the head. So first and foremost, my recommendation is to do your homework. And what I mean by that is check the weather, read the bulletin, dial in your gear, understand the complexities of the terrain that you're going into and be in shape and ready to perform in the event that you need to, because sometimes things don't always go as expected. Uh, second one, shut up and listen. What I mean by that is there's a lot of things going on in the backcountry that require a little bit of focus and concentration. Um, to those of you who enjoy you know, walking into town with their headphones in, that's great. I don't recommend walking up a skin track with your headphones in. There's a lot going on underneath your feet and a lot of subtle nuances of the weather that day, things that are changing, evolution in the snowpack as you climb in elevation that you need to be paying attention to. The other side of shut up and listen is, yeah, if you've been lucky enough to be invited into the backcountry with somebody that has a bit more experience than you, it's time to pay attention, okay? Uh, three, I don't need to go into number three, bring good snacks, okay? Sometimes people wake up a little late in the morning and maybe their lunch isn't awesome and watching somebody else eat homemade chocolate chip cookies is just absolutely painful. So if you're going to bring some snacks, bring extras for two reasons. Number one, yes, for your touring partners. And number two, to be in your backpack in case something does happen and you find yourself out in the mountains late at night, you'll have something to eat to make good decisions. Number four, be humble. Um, you don't know what you don't know is probably the best way to put that, meaning that you're going to learn a lot in the first couple years of your backcountry career. And probably the one thing you're going to learn is how much you don't know. And that's something that I'm continuing to learn every day. As much time as I have spent studying and, and as much time as I have spent touring, I still have a lot to learn, okay? So when you're in the back country, express your knowledge and express interest in understanding more. Nobody likes a know-it-all, okay? Um, and last but not least, something that I seem to have to learn time and time again, be cheerfully willing to bail. What I mean by that is pay attention to the attitudes of your partners, pay attention to what's going on around you and be prepared to back off of an objective if it's not going as planned. Or if it took you a little bit longer to get there than you expected. Or if your partner is not feeling awesome that day. Or if the snow is just a little weird and you're not sure. Being cheerfully willing to bail is probably the number one quality that I look for in a, in a touring partner, other than snacks, of course. Um, for the ladies in the group, uh, I want to also, uh, you know, kind of point these guys out, Mountain Mentors. I was a, a member of the Mountain Mentors program last year. What it is, is a group of girls coming together to pair up mentors and mentees to try and share knowledge and education amongst the community. Um, unfortunately, the registration for the winter program has already closed, um, but they do all sorts of mentorship relationships, including climbing and hiking and all sorts of things like that. So um, like I said, for the ladies, please look into these girls. They're doing an amazing job in the community. Okay, what do we got? 
Right. On that note, um, the Women's Backcountry Series, Larry alluded to it a little bit earlier on. Um, the Women's Backcountry Series is a backcountry education community program that I put together last year um, to help foster a sense of, yeah, uh, to help foster, you know, the relationships amongst women. Really, what I'm trying to do is I'm not trying to gender segregate in the backcountry. I've definitely had some critics um, that, you know, have said it's important for women to be touring with other members of the community. Of course it is. Absolutely it is. But unfortunately, when inexperienced members of the backcountry community go out with experienced members of the backcountry community, it's quite common that the inexperienced people kind of don't really say much, tend to nod their head a lot. And in spite of, you know, pain and doubt and fear seem to continue on. The whole point of the Women's Backcountry series is to allow women an environment to develop their skills and develop their confidence to say no. So realistically, yeah, I, I want women to be strong members of the community and I want these girls to have the power to say no if they feel uncomfortable or to ask questions if they feel unsure. There's been a lot of good that's come from the program so far and I'm looking forward to having it keep going for this season. Uh, I've got a couple dates upcoming. Um, Saturday, December 5th is my first intro, uh, the introduction to backcountry skiing splitboarding. What the intro is, it's, it's a one day course that just kind of gets your feet wet. Uh, we take you into the back country, we get you on the gear, we tell you all the nuances of how to transition from uphill to downhill, how to set a skin track and move on that skin track. Um, and just a little bit about some of the hazards that you're gonna be looking into. The intro is a great way to get a little bit of experience with the gear if you're looking to take your AST1 especially and you just want to have a little bit more confidence moving into that two-day course. Saturday, Sunday, December 12th and 13th is the first AST1 for the Women's Backcountry Series. Um, I've just been informed that I think it's mostly sold out but I think there might be one or two spaces remaining. So if you're interested in those dates work for you, um, please definitely go on to the Mountain Skills Academy website and book that course. Um, Sunday, January 3rd is, yeah. So the Companion Rescue Clinic is something that I've been trying to um, promote for the last couple of years. The Companion Rescue Clinic is a one day in depth um, look at Companion Rescue. And yes, it goes beyond the scope of AST1 for sure. The AST1 Companion Rescue Curriculum looks at single burial um, rescues in safe terrain when few other considerations have to be made. The Companion Rescue course will go more in depth into multiple burial situations, deep burial situations, how to lead a group rescue, um, and other hazards that have to be considered in, in, in more complex rescue situations. These courses we're, are going to recycle over the course of the season, meaning that um, every couple of months, every month, I'm going to do my best to have these pro programs run again. So as you can see, Saturday, January 9th, I'm running another intro, and January 16th, 17th, I'm running another AST1. For more dates, please go on to the Mountain Skills Academy website, click on Women's Series, and you'll be able to pull up all the information there. Now, again, I am definitely sensitive to what's going on um, with this uh, global pandemic right now. So please, if you have a group of friends in mind and you want to get some training and keep that group small, um, give us a call, send us an email, info at mountainskillsacademy.com, and we're going to do our best to tailor a curriculum to you and your friends, okay? So even if you have somebody that's just starting out and you have somebody that's two or three years in, we're going to make it work, and we're going to make sure everybody is learning up and above their current standard, okay? Um, for everybody that has tuned in uh, so far tonight, I just wanna let you know that you will be receiving a discount on your AST1 course if you book with Mountain Skills Academy. Um, so you're gonna get 15% off. You go to the website, you pick which dates you want, and there'll be a promo code space there. You're gonna type escape 15. Now this code is going to be good for not just the Women's Backcountry Series, it's going to be good for any of the MSA Backcountry programs. So that includes crevasse rescue, AST1, AST2, anything else that you're thinking about taking. Okay, um, I think that's kind of me for the evening. 
Uh, so Larry, if you're ready, I'm gonna probably turn it over to you. If I can figure out this technology here, there we go. Um, before I go, I just want to say thanks very much, guys. It's, uh, yeah, it's it's not an easy thing getting into the backcountry. And I do encourage you that if you have questions to please let us know. Um, Facebook is a wonderful medium for that. So there is a Women's Backcountry Series Facebook group. I'm trying to encourage people that are part of the group um, to write questions on the wall and I can respond to you there. Or if you have questions directly for me, you can email Mountain Skills Academy. All right. Thanks guys, have a good night. All right, thank you, April. That was fantastic, uh, very well presented. And uh, I know that everyone out watching will certainly have learned an awful lot from her. We will do a Q&A by the way, after uh, my segment here. And uh, we'll read out the questions that come through the chat uh, aspect. We'll answer them uh, either uh, April or myself. And we'll make sure that uh, you know, we get uh, your questions answered. So, my turn. So I'm back here. I want to talk to you about, uh, of course, products, uh, how easy it is to get involved with backcountry. But first and foremost, I just want to comment a couple of things. We have two stores in town. We have the Escape Group store here in Marketplace. As you can see through go behind me, we focus on the retail aspects of the products whether that is the, you know, the basics of getting involved in the hard goods, boots, bindings, you know, uh, Abbey uh, gear, touring, uh, sorry, skis, backpacks, also soft goods or clothing, base layers. And then we have the Escape Route Alpine Demo Center. And uh, that is located, for those of you that don't know, beside the entrance to the uh, Keg Brandy's Bar, if you guys have ever been there before. Uh, that's where we do all of our uh, rentals and demos of all of our gear. So pretty much everything that you see here, we rent at our Alpine Demo Center. And uh, that's where you can go to get all of your touring gear as well as uh, camping, whether that's winter camping, hot camping during the winter months, if you want to explore a little bit more in regards to what you can do in the backcountry. We're fortunate to have a lot of free huts uh, throughout BC, and uh, they're a lot of fun to take advantage of. Now, let's talk more about uh, touring. So we'll kind of get into the nitty gritty. I mean, most people, when you talk touring, they envision a beautiful deep powder snow and not a track in front. And I can say that that is definitely what enticed me into it out of the gate. Well, powder is my drug, and when it comes to touring, I don't want to see a track in front of me. Now, that means sometimes that I need to you know, walk that little extra distance to get it, but it's well worthwhile. Interestingly, though, the more you spend doing touring, the more you realize that there's the adventure aspect that actually keeps you wanting to come back. So definitely, powder is a great draw. Absolutely phenomenal. Nice to be able to get 2,000 foot descents without a track in front of you. But it's what you can do with touring that also really kind of locks you in long term because you don't have to go out and tour for four hours to get that high peak off in the distance. Really nice thing about touring is you can do a little simple tour out to the top of Flute or Oboe one of our local peaks and have a picnic on a beautiful sunny afternoon. You know, it does not have to be something hard. And when we first get out and start touring, it's really important to realize that you want to get out and have some fun, you know, build an adventure around it, make it enjoyable for you. You don't want it to be a forced march. That'll come as you get more and more involved in it. And uh, you definitely will end up being more and more involved in it. So let's talk about gear. You know, to get into backcountry skiing and or split boarding, by the way, I should comment uh, that, of course, we, we do both. And so when I talk about skiing, I'm really alluding to both, both uh, split boarding and uh, skiing. You know, there's a few things that you really need out of the gate are your avalanche safety gear that's really important. And what I'm talking about 
is transceivers, probes, shovels, and to a strong degree, uh, avalanche airbags. And we'll touch upon that in a little bit. So what's a transceiver? I'm just gonna step over here. Transceivers are devices uh, that is an absolute necessity for you to go out into the back country. We rent them, they're very inexpensive, but it's really something you should never go into the back country with, without, because if you do happen to get into trouble, get involved in a slide, these are gonna save your lives. And what they do, for those that don't know, is that they send a signal out that allows people to switch their transceiver, if you were to get involved in a slide, to search for the signal that that is putting out. Transceivers, by the way, should always be worn in the chest harness. The reason why is that when someone is digging out a burial uh, person, they're digging to where the transceiver is. If you are wearing it down in the thigh of your pant, that's where they're gonna dig to. The problem is our mouth is not down at the thigh of our pant, it's up here. So if I can offer any insight, please use the chest harnesses that they come in and not in the thighs. Now, there's a variety of different makes out there. Um, and they do range in price point based on the, whether it's a professional version or what I'd like to call a consumer version. Consumer versions are very easy to use. All transceivers nowadays run on the latest uh, frequency, 457 megahertz, and they all have really easy to follow uh, LCD screens. And these screens allow you to follow arrows that guide you to the uh, placement of the burial. So very important. Uh, you'll, it's much like a helmet when you, you'll ride a bike or a motorbike, you know, if you have a 10 cent head by a 10 cent helmet, certainly this is one area that you should not buy the least expensive on the market because they do impact the range that they pick up the signal from. And the further away you can pick up a signal, the faster that you can get to your friend uh, and dig them out and save your lives. So there's a variety we sell, you know, of course, uh, black diamonds, we sell my boots, uh, we sell uh, BCAs, uh, trackers, um, and they're all fantastic. They make it very easy. The last thing on transceivers I wanna tell you about, this is also very key, practice, practice, practice. The more comfortable you are using a transceiver, and using it to search for someone who's been buried, the easier it will be when and if it actually happens. I've been very fortunate, I've never been involved in an avalanche, I've never been involved in a recovery of anyone in my parties being involved in an avalanche. It's got a lot to do with how I view the safety and how all of my touring friends view safety. And you guys need to too. But if a friend gets buried, it's a very stressful situation and you want something that's very easy to use and you also want to be able to know how to use it. So please practice as much as possible. So transceivers. The other aspect that uh, we talked about, and I'm just going to step over here, is avalanche shovels. Now shovels come in a variety of different sizes. We have a very small blade here with uh, very much of a, a cutting edge. When snow avalanches, it does not come down and, uh, and, and settle as nice, soft, deep, easy powder. It actually settles into basically concrete. It's extremely difficult to dig through. So you want to make sure that your shovel has a metal blade on it. You can still buy plastic blades. I would highly not suggest it. There's also, as you can see, differences in the size of the shovel themselves. So if you are smaller in stature, please buy a shovel that's got a smaller blade. The reason why is it's going to move less snow with each uh, shovel full. 
you've got bigger, more muscular back, you can certainly go to a larger blade. This will allow you to move more snow. But if you're using a big shovel blade and you're a little smaller in stature, you're gonna tire very quickly. And the way that we wanna see people dug out of avalanches nowadays is a very fast motion where we're literally scooping as fast as we can that snow behind us to where someone else is then moving it behind them and down what we call the conveyor belt system. So do buy a shovel that makes sense for your strength. Additionally, of course, they are all very light. They should be very light. And they all come apart, sorry, so that you can very easily store them in your backpack. And the idea being, of course, that they snap together very easily. Here we see a shaft that is not round. So there's no sense that you're having to look for how the heck do you line up that uh, clip. And of course, it allows you as well to extend the blade out. So you've got a much, sorry, extend the, uh, uh, the shaft out. So you have a much better way to dig very quickly to get down to the, uh, the burial uh, victim. Shovels are really key. Here we see a T handle. You can also get what's called a D handle. Whichever will fits more comfortably in your hand. It's a matter of preference. I do like the T handle myself. And we're seeing, you know, rather than you know, digging this way, we're now more digging this way. I'm pushing that stone behind us. And the next person in the party moves it back so we can very quickly get down to where the person is. Thirdly, in an avalanche safety kit is what's called the probe. Probes are devices that allow you to quickly take that out of your path and literally pull it out and allow you to snap together a device that allows you to probe into the snow path for your uh, burial victim. Probes come in different sizes. You can get as short as 240 centimeters and they go all the way up to 320 centimeters. Because we live in that coastal uh, area, we tend to get a lot of snow and our snowpack is a lot deeper than what we would traditionally see in Europe. I would highly recommend that you always get the longest probe that you can. The reason being is that as we're probing the snowpack, you know, our snowpacks can easily get above uh, 300 centimeters and there's nothing worse if you're running a 240 centimeter probe, each time you go to probe, you've got to bend down to push that probe as far down into the snowpack as you can. If you have a much longer probe, it allows you to do it more upright, hence it's a lot, lot more efficient and a lot more effective in trying to find that person. So probes, by the way, come in aluminum or carbon. Carbon, of course, allows you lighter. It also allows uh, generally for less deflection. Deflection being as you put that probe down through the snow, that it's not angling out on you. You want that probe to travel straight down to where hopefully you know, the person is that's been buried. So the unfortunate aspect, of course, is carbon, much like mountain bikes, the lighter everything is, the more expensive it is. And certainly that's the case with uh, uh, carbon probes. You can certainly buy a very good, inexpensive probe that's aluminum, that will be very effective might be a little bit heavier, but we're talking grams, not pounds. And so don't be afraid. Go buy something that fits your budget. I think that's really important. That's also the case whether it is a shovel. And the transceiver, as I mentioned, you'll definitely look at another aspect of being, you'll afford what you can. The better it is, the easier it is, the faster you'll be able to locate your, uh, your, your friends uh, or friend that they happen to be buried. So those three items should always go out with you anytime you go into the back country. And I should comment, there's no such thing as slack country. You'll hear that term. Anytime you go beyond the boundary of our resort or any mountains resort, you are in the back country. That means there's no longer any uh, your, uh, mountain safety being used to ensure 
feel that the slopes are bombed regularly. It is backcountry. And as soon as you step beyond that, you need to be prepared for it. It's too easy to think, oh, I'm just gonna do some slack country. And of course that immediately can get you into trouble. Anytime you're in the backcountry, probe, shovel, transceiver are a necessity, a must. You need to learn how to use them. And that of course is where uh, MSA comes in as uh, April spoke to you about. So those are the three main components of your avalanche safety gear. I talked about an avalanche airbag. They are phenomenal. The success rate on them is, um, is uh, 97% uh, for saving you in an avalanche. They come in a variety of different uh, makes, models, uh, designs. Sorry about that. <laughs> Thank you, April. They come canister based. They come uh, air based fan-based as we uh, also refer to them. Of course, a fan-based costs more, but allows you to, especially if you're on a uh, multi-day trip, to utilize the airbag up to five times before having to recharge it. It also means that there is no hesitation as to whether, should I be pulling this to save me? Is the avalanche big enough? Whereas with a canister-based airbag, you get one pull. That sometimes stops people from pulling it because they're not sure if they should or not. So if you can't afford an airbag, they're phenomenal for you. Certainly, uh, you'll save up your pennies. I highly recommend them to everyone. And uh, if not, definitely go out with just a regular a backpack that has the space for you to take your probes, shovels, extra gloves, water, some food, an extra uh, down layer generally that you can put on you if it's a very cold or if someone gets injured, you can provide it to them to keep them warm. So uh, I won't spend any more time on airbags because that in itself is a big conversation based on all the many different uh, aspects that they have on it. So one of the things about touring is that, you know, what's the difference between Alpine and Touring, and it really comes down to the gear. So Alpine, of course, we're familiar with, whether we're on a snowboard or skis, you know, you've got your board, you have your boots, you have your poles if you're a skier, and you rip all around the resort. Fantastic. Doesn't matter what the weight of the gear is, because you just jump on a chairlift, and you're back up on top, and away you go again. When we get into touring, you, know, you can easily get into it in a very expensive way. You can use your Alpine boots. You can use your Alpine snowboard boots. The gear is designed so that you can get into it quite inexpensively, but there are variations. When I first started ski touring, I was in my Alpine boots and I used a product that was called Alpine Trekkers. Matter of fact, I used them for 10 years. That's very old technology by today's standards, but it was very effective. And basically what it was, is it took, let's pull this binding down here. It took this style of a binding. And what it was, was an Alpine binding that you would uh, you know, clip into your Alpine bindings. And it had a lever on it attached to the bottom of your boot that allowed you to actually walk. Work great. Nowadays though, we have in this case, what we call a rail binding. It's called a rail binding because we have, just let me uh, pull this back. We have an alpine binding that's been built onto a rail. The advantage of the rail is that it allows you to wear your alpine boots and physically walk with your alpine boot and a binding that accommodates. Very inexpensive way to get involved in touring. You can pick these up used uh, for very inexpensive prices and it's a great way to get into the system, uh, into touring. The downside to them is that each step you make, you're actually lifting up the binding. That's a lot of weight on the bottom of your boot, but it's a great way to get involved at an inexpensive price. You can mount them on any ski. It doesn't have to be a lightweight touring ski, just to get you out there and to enjoy it. 
The other nice thing, of course, it allows you to rip around on the resort. No fears. It's an alpine binding. The only downside is the weight, but it works very well. As we tend to get more into touring, we end up looking at uh, different bindings and we get more involved into what's called hybrid bindings. And then uh, a good example of a hybrid binding is this. I'll use this. This is the Atomic Shift. Also, it'll go under the name branded as a Solomon. And what it allows you to do is to use a tech boot. Tech boot is one that has the little inserts here that allow the pins, the tech binding, to clip into. The advantage of pins is that when you tour, you're now just lifting the boot and not lifting the weight of the binding as well. So it's a really nice uh, system because as you can see right now, looks just like your everyday Alpine binding, but you can easily convert it by pulling this lever down, now exposes the pins or, or, or tech pins, and that allows you to now tour uphill with a tech compatible boot. We have a lot of boots being manufactured now by the Alpine companies that include those tech inserts that allow you to walk up the hill. So as you get more into it, the bindings have changed a lot. This is more what we would call a true tech binding or a pin binding. This will not allow you to use an Alpine boot in it. It has to have tech compatibility. The beauty of it is that it's considerably lighter than those two versions that I've shown you. And it's extremely easy to use. You step into it and out of it very much like you would just a regular Alpine binding. The pins close in on your inserts on the toe of your boot and the heel, I'll just rotate this, the heel clips into these two pins here to secure you much as you're secured on an Alpine uh, binding setup. The difference is, is that you do not have a cup on the back of the heel piece that holds down the boot. These two pins snap into the back of a boot. Use this one as an example. And the pins actually spread open as they go in and then they snap closed over top. So tech bindings, pin bindings are DIN certified. The difference being in an Alpine boot, you have a DIN setting in the toe for horizontal release. And in the heel, you have a straight vertical release. In most tech bindings, there's two DIN settings in the heel. That allows a vertical release and allows a horizontal release. And this all came about when tech bindings were initially uh, designed back in the 60s. And that was because the theory was they felt that it was easier on the knee to have you release at the heel this way, horizontally and vertically, rather than at the toe, less stress on the knee. And that's where this whole concept came from. And it works extremely well. I ski these bindings all over the resort. I have no issues or fears of them pre-releasing or not releasing. I've never had them not come off when they're supposed to. And I've always had them stay on when they're supposed to. They're very capable. I will tell you though, that the first time you put your toe into one, your boot, and you look down and you go, oh my gosh, is that gonna hold me? The answer is yes. Now, one other thing on a, on a binding like this is that on the heel, we simply rotate it to go into walk mode. This brake automatically locks into the raised position. That would now allow your heel to move up and down without engaging the pins on the back of the binding because we have rotated those sideways. The real beauty is these devices here. These are called climbing aids or steps. Because these are on the back of the heel of the binding, 
They're extremely easy to use. You literally use the basket on your pole to just flip these forward and back because as we tour up, it's never a steady slope. It always undulates. And if you can use your climbing aids easily, you will use them all the time. And that allows you to become a lot more efficient. A lot of the hybrid bindings that I showed you and the rail binding, they have climbing aids, but they're generally under the boot itself. And that necessitates either having to bend down to manually flick it with your hand, which is a pain in the butt, in the wind, if you have to do it repeatedly. Uh, or you need to take your ski pole point and try and maneuver it into engaging it and disengaging it. What ends up happening, because it's not easy to use, you end up not using it as efficiently as you should. Awesome. This is an area where you will get into the more you spend as a tour, ski tour, like anything. When you first start mountain biking, you're on a very inexpensive bike. You start to enjoy it, you start to like it, you get a better bike. And before you know it, you're riding a $10,000 bike. Same with ski touring. With the bindings, the more you get into it, the lighter your bindings become. To the point that you end up purchasing bindings like this. Doesn't look like much, does it? It's extremely light but yet it's still extremely capable. And of course, the lighter the gear, the easier and the quicker it is to get up the hill. But that's for down the road. Well, we want to talk about how easy is it for you to get in. We've got a couple of good solutions. Certainly use gear is very important. Please, that when you do buy it, uh, you'll have someone that knows touring You'll look it over on your behalf to guide you as to whether it's a good purchase or not, whether it's being beat up, uh, is it in good shape, because that will certainly, that's important for you. You want your bindings to be always in good working condition to keep you safe when you're out there. You want to make sure it always releases if it needs to be. So that's a, a quick overview on bindings for you. I'm just going to put this one back. Then I want to talk about ski boots. So we talked about being able to use your Alpine boots. It works very well. I did that for 10 years. And uh, you're just letting me know the time here. <laughs> so on ski boots, an Alpine boot does not have what's called a walk mode. A walk mode is a device, a clip at the back that unhinges the cuff of the boot so that we can now walk more uh, casually as we would in a normal street shoe, rather than walking like a robot as we do whenever we're in uh, an alpine. Uh, luckily, slip boarding, by the way, a lot easier. The boots and bindings, of course, are different, but it allows you to do the same thing as we're talking about with ski gear. Uh, with the walk mode, that provides you the range of motion that allows you to walk very comfortably, whether that's from your car to the bottom of the lifts to get up the hill or to go out and tour. Nice thing about touring uh, boots is that they are extremely comfortable. Reason being, uh, Alpine boots are designed and focused on performance, comfort, and then warmth because they know if you get cold toes, you just go into the lodge and warm up your toes. Ski touring, on the other hand, manufacturers, they're very concerned about warmth, comfort, and then performance, because there is no lodge going to warm up your toes. The liners on ski touring boots are thicker because they need that warmth. We want you to have more room in your toes, so it's a lot more comfortable. So it's a different fit than what you would get from an Alpine boot. And of course, uh, you know, that comfort with that added thickness is really nice. So Alpine boots work great. A lot of people though will buy what we call a combi boot. A combi boot is, and I'll use this uh, DinaFit as an example, looks very much like an Alpine boot, but it's got an exceptional walk mold on it. It also has the stiffness 
that people are used to in a resort style booth that you can you'll know, just drive your skis like crazy on a hard icy day and motor down the hill but it also gives you the benefit of having a really nice booth to tour with because it gives you you know up to 70 degrees of motion in that upper top that's a really nice feature most of the combi boots have very little rocker in the sole but they all have rubber soles and rubber soles are really nice for grip also for comfort so any boot with a rubber sole, you need to use a binding that has a toe height adjustment. It's very important because you see that there's rocker built into that boot, so it walks a lot easier. And that it also, with that rubber sole, will impact the amount of pressure it puts onto your toe piece. With this boot, I can step into any alpine binding. The problem is, it will go in, but your release values on your binding go right out the window. So if you normally ski as a din of 10, all of a sudden you put this boot in that binding, you're gonna end up with a din of 30 plus because it's just not gonna be able to release as you want. As you get more into touring, we move on from alpine boots to hybrid boots, and we get into you know, more touring boots. So once again, you know, the lighter they are, the more efficient it is to be able to get up the mountain. Uh, you know, it's almost like you got a pair of running shoes on. And surprisingly, they still ski well. So the nice thing about ski touring is we tend to go up when the weather's really nice. The snow is beautiful, lots of soft powder. We don't need a 130 flex alpine boot to be able to turn our skis in. And that's something that uh, a nice lightweight touring boot will do for you. So we talked about bindings, talked about boots, talked about alpine gear. Uh, we still need to talk about uh, skis. Uh, and uh, I can't see my notes because the bright light has blinded me. <laughs> so now I go to read, it's like, what the heck? Uh, da, 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 da. Oh, of course, skins. How could I forget? So, when you go touring, whether it's on a split board or a snowboard, a split board, or skis, I should say, you need a pair of skins. Skins allow you to walk uphill. And basically, it comes about because way back when, at the beginning of ski touring, they literally used seal skins because seal fur, when you push it one way, the uh, hairs fall down, allowing you to glide. And yet when you went the other way, it pulled the hairs up, which gave you that traction to walk up the hill. So nowadays with skins, we have three types. The least expensive to uh, purchase are synthetic skins. So these are um, you know, touring skins that are 100% synthetic and uh, the Fibers are very stiff and really easy to walk uphill on because those stiff fibers allow you to penetrate the snow and get easy grip. It's very difficult when we first start out uh, skinning. You know, we're not sure on the technique. Most of us tend to bend a little bit too much forward at the waist and that unweights the skin and we end up falling forward onto our knees and hands all the time. So we really want to skin more upright. So synthetic skins are least expensive. They also tend to be the heaviest and don't glide as well. You then go to what's called a Momex. That's where you'll get a skin and it's made 30% synthetic, 70% mohair. Mohair is a animal and they use the fur of it to create a skin that is a lot lighter and gives you much better glide. So a skin, by the way, looks like this. We've got a glue on the back. And the idea of the glue is that this attaches to the base of your ski, sticks to it. So I would put this skin, this is my shovel clip that just fits over the shovel. I put the skin on and with a little pressure, it adheres to the bottom of your ski and then you have at the very back your tail clip. 
and this clip will just flip over the rear of the tail of the ski and that will hold it in place and allow you to skin up at the top of where you're going at which point we will take the skin off once again glue it back together as such and then that goes back into your pack there is a third skin that i haven't talked about yet and that is 100 percent pure mole hair skin so it's the lightest has the most fly uh, still climbs well but there are issues with it uh, depending on transitions in the weather, whether we're going from rain into softer snow, they tend to work better at colder temperatures, whereas the synthetics will work in any type of temperature. And the mole mix is really, that's that 70% mole hair, 30% uh, nylon synthetic will work really well in uh, all conditions as well. So skins, a key component, you do need them. And that, that's what helps you get up unbelievably how efficient with a pair of skins, a pair of boots and a binding, how quickly you can reach those far peaks that you might be uh, eyeing up as you go out into the back. So I want to talk about skis. Skis are an important part of touring, but they're not as important as the other aspects. So you can buy very lightweight skis they're amazingly fast going up, but oftentimes they're very uh, flimsy for going down because they're designed with a focus on uphill travel rather than downhill travel. You can tour with any ski, right? Pick up a used pair at the Reuse It Center for 30 bucks. That'll make a great touring ski. You know, the difference is, of course, you know, how wide you want that ski, how long you same with split boarding, you will generally go a little bit longer than you normally would ski because you've got more weight on your back with your backpack. So you load up your backpack, all of a sudden, you know, I'm normally 180 pounds, well, with my pack on, now I'm 190 pounds. That's gonna impact you know, the flotation that I'm getting out of my ski. So sometimes we'll go a little bit wider. The average width of the ski, generally, you know, in uh, the coastal uh, uh, climates, we're looking at about 95 to maybe 112 maximum as a width underfoot. You know, going any wider, you're just gaining more weight, and uh, you'll potentially, depending on the humidity of the snow, that ski becomes a lot heavier because the snow will stick to the top sheet of the ski, and all of a sudden, each step they're taking, you've got a pound of snow on top of your ski. So a good all-round ski, between those ranges, as I commented, length for a little bit longer. If you're normally skiing a 176 centimeter ski, you'll jump to a 184 for your touring ski. Uh, you'll, once again, though I can get into details in regards to the skis themselves, as to your differences, there are lightweight touring, they're good all around touring skis. So they're light, yet still stiff enough to handle your crud and ice on the way back down. Also, though you want to ski with a turn radius that fits your skiing style, turn radius is another completely uh, different uh, topic to talk about, and I'm not going to get into that. But bottom line, you can get all of this gear quite inexpensively, whether it's new or used, to allow you to get into the uh, backcountry itself. So that's what I want to talk about uh, in regards to gear. How's my time, by the way, you two? Bang on? Yeah, you have maybe five, ten minutes. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I've got uh, a few minutes still to go. That's good. Um, I want to talk about uh, what is next on my list. And excuse me, I'm going to have to have a quick look here. Oh, we're at eight, um, so we're going to go a bit over time, but, Are we okay? but it's okay, you can get what you need. Yeah. Um. So uh, what I'm going to do is that uh, I'm going to talk about um, something that you know, we want to make available to you. Uh, the escape route uh, is offering a 25% off uh, cost for touring gear. We'd love to see you get out and try it. So between now and December 23rd, all of you are available to use our gear, get out and try touring, 
go with your friends at 25% off that regular cost. There is a code that you will need to use. When you go on to our website at escaperoute.ca, you'll see a button, rentals, you'll click on it. And that'll allow you to go through what skis are available, what type of bindings, because we do both rail bindings for those of you with Alpine boots, or if you want to try tech bindings, we also rent, of course, the tech boots. Adds a little bit more of a cost, but allows you to get a feel for what it's like to ski with the lighter weight touring gear. When you come, well, after you've reserved your product, you would then type in, there's a box for a code, and it's the code for you guys is called Try Touring. So if you type Try Touring into that code box, that will allow you to receive 25% off any of our touring gear to allow you to get out. And this is our way of saying, try it. I know you're going to like it. It's very addictive, very uh, much um, uh, something that once you do a couple of times, you'll want to do it all the time. And just please take advantage of it. That's available for all of you. The last thing I'll comment before I wrap up and we uh, go to your uh, questions, and that is that you know, um, April alluded to your, um, your physical capabilities. Touring is something that uh, you can do. You don't have to be in really good shape, right? You don't have to be this machine to be able to go out and enjoy it. Doesn't matter whether you haven't ridden your bike or you haven't done a lot of exercise in the last few years, as long as you can ski or snowboard confidently, we'd like to say, you know, at least an intermediate level, you can get out and ski tour. And uh, what you'll find is that we have lots of exceptional ski touring off of our peaks throughout the uh, resort or off of behind our resort. And of course, lots of areas within the Ski to Sky corridor, the Duffy, for example, uh, Cloudburst, Rainbow, uh, Sprout, all these different areas up and down the uh, valley. So thank you. Uh, that's all I have to uh, provide for you. I really hope that you can take advantage of our 25% uh, savings. I really look forward to seeing you out on the hills. And uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to type them in now. And I believe that uh, April wants to give away a couple of items. April? I think we're going to do the questions first before the giveaway. All right. There we go. Sorry, we're going to do questions first. Then we'll do the giveaway. So um, let's see if there are any questions. We just got people checking out the... Uh... So there was a question. Uh, it says, which binding makes the best use of pins, but it's also best for downhill? Okay, I don't know if you guys heard that. One of the questions was, what binding makes best use of touring and also a downhill skiing? So from my perspective, the best uh, binding and also the least expensive is this one from Phenotip. It's called the uh, ST10 or the Rotation 10. It's an extremely stable binding, solid binding for skiing in the Alpine Resort. Literally rip all over the mountain on it. I love to ski very fast and I do with no compunction in this binding. There are those combi bindings that I talked about specifically, for example, the Atomic Shift or the Solomon Shift. The downside to them is that you can alpine, you can tour, but they're not as easy to use. And this is an exceptional binding that allows you to do both uh, tour and alpine. And I think it's a great uh, uh, binding for you to consider. You can also find them uh, quite inexpensively on the used market. Benefit has been building this design for years. It's very much proven, unbelievably capable, very light. Thank you. All right, I'm gonna chime back in here for a second. We have a few more questions um, from the wall. So the question was, do we also rent split boards? Does the escape route rent split boards? Absolutely, they rent split boards. They have an amazing fleet. Um, and there was another question here. Uh, somebody would like to get a list of the products that you've mentioned during your presentation, Larry. So if you could put that together and we'll post that on the escape route Facebook group, maybe. 
by all means, I'd be happy to put that uh, list together for you. Amazing. Uh, another question that we have here was how much is the women's intro day? Um, so that day we currently have priced at 239, but of course you are going to get a 15% discount with the code escape 15. Um, how much is the AST one? Uh, if I remember correctly off the top of my head, the AST one is 279. So again, that includes one classroom day and a field day as well. And we also have the option to extend that course. So if you want to take an AST one plus for a small fee, we can add an extra backcountry day to that course and uh, get you guys a little bit more experience on the skin track. Any other questions that we have coming in? Do you have intro groups that are not just for women? Absolutely. Um, so if you go on to the Mountain Skills Academy uh, webpage, I'm trying to see here. Let me follow the links. You're going to click on. Um, let's see, let's see. Let's see, where am I? If you click on ski, which is the uh, icon on the very far left, and then intro to skiing and split boarding, um, and that's going to pop up there for you. And like I said, guys, please keep in mind that we can do these days as a private, um, and in fact, we encourage it. Do you have, where are we here? Any more questions? Uh, people would like to see the slideshow. Absolutely. I can see if I can get the slideshow posted for you guys. Any other questions about gear? I know that Larry talked a lot about <laughs> touring skis and touring boots. Um, if you guys have questions about split boards, I'm definitely the person to talk to. I am technically obsessed with that stuff. I've had my trials and tribulations over the years. So uh, please, if you have questions about that gear, let me know. Um, I've just heard that uh, split board gear is in high demand at this point in time. So uh, definitely do your research and get on that guys sooner rather than later. Um, are there any questions right now about differences in split board bindings or anything like that that I can answer for you guys? Any resources for split board reviews? Um, that from, that's from Mike. Vert. I don't have anything off the top of my head, but Mike, I will uh, put some resources together for you and get back to you tomorrow. Let me, I'm going to write your name down, Mike, so I don't forget. Um, and maybe I'll put those reviews up on the Mountain Skills Academy Facebook page. Okay, Mike? What else? How much variety of split boards does the escape route have? So, Last year, I remember that you guys had Arbor, and what else were you guys hosting? Uh, we did uh, G3, Arbor, a uh, Slime, and uh, shoot, I'm missing a brand. G3, Arbor, Slime, and... Green Park. <laughs> Is this all going to be on your website? Yep. Okay. Yeah, so they'll have the full list of resources on the website. Um, another question from Alex. Sorry, not regarding gear, but any chance you could send us the full show if you did record it? Absolutely. So we have recorded the whole show and we're going to post it on, I think, the Escape Route uh, webpage? Um, to be announced. To maybe be announced. Our, maybe our YouTube page. <laughs> maybe the YouTube page. Okay, we're going to figure that out, but we definitely have recorded it. Um, and we'll get that to you. We'll make sure we have the information out there for you. What kind of group size would make it worthwhile doing a private AST1 with friends? Um, so the price of a private AST1 is standard. Let me pull that up here for a second, just so I am speaking the truth here. So AST1 Whistler, and I'm going to go down, private course, book now. Here we go. So, so the price, price for, for a private course, course is $13.99 for an AST1, and that's two days. So the difference between a public and a private, the big difference really is that we don't have to pay um, for a classroom with a private course. So if you guys have a location where we can do the classroom session, it actually makes it a little bit cheaper. Um, so I think for six people, it actually ends up being more affordable than doing a public course. So like I said, we highly, highly encourage um, the private courses. Are there specific liners that would save your feet from the cold? Definitely. Larry, Larry has something to say about that. Hello. Oh, 
There are uh, definitely liners that you can get. Intuition, which is a, a Vancouver company, uh, makes uh, tremendous liners that we can use to put inside an existing Alpine boot to make it considerably warmer and much more comfortable. Uh, generally, you'll find, by the way, most of the liners that you buy in touring boots right now are, as I uh, commented, extremely warmer than what you would get in an Alpine boot because they run a much thinner liner based on their focus on performance. But intuition, awesome liners, very inexpensive, $199, uh, and that gets you a variety of different liners depending whether you need low volume, high volume, medium volume. I hope that answers your question. Okay, I can attest to the intuition liners are an absolute lifesaver. Um, I'm a bit of a weird person. I'm a hard boot split boarder, which means that I use ski boots to go split boarding. The boots that I bought, if I didn't put intuitions in them, would have been just absolutely hopeless. Um, and just this year, I've kept with the same boots and replaced the liners, and they feel like brand new boots again. So I'm very happy about that. Um, what else? What is the ideal size of a touring group in the backcountry? That's a really good question. So as you evolve in your career, you're going to get more comfortable going out as a partnership with people. But starting out, I recommend no less than three, no more than four. And I know that's quite specific. Um, yeah, you know, if you're just starting out, it's important to have other people there to bounce ideas off of and other people there to help out in the event of an injury or something like that any more than four people. Um, what I say in an AST one is that if you have a group of four people, about two to three people end up making the decisions. If you have a group of six people, about two to three people end up making the decisions. If you have a group of 25 people, about two to three people end up making the decisions. So keeping the group small, but not too small starting out, I think is really important. Three to four is kind of the key in my opinion. Um, are you doing, are you demoing touring skis right now, Larry? Uh, we are, I'll just quickly jump in. Yes, we are uh, demoing uh, and renting our ski gear right now. Not our whole fleet because we have some uh, brand new, very expensive uh, touring gear that we won't let out, but we have a better understanding of what the snowpack is. Last year, for example, it was a very bad snow year at the start. And so you know, we limited uh, access to that high-end product. This year, we're off to a really good start. I think that uh, you'll, our concerns will be allayed very quickly in regards to snowpack. So yes, you can rent immediately. We do have uh, AST groups going out this weekend in conjunction with MSA. And uh, of course, a lot of their uh, clients are renting their gear from us. Hopefully that answers that for you. Thank you. Okay, so we're gonna wrap it up here pretty soon. There's a couple more questions that I might want to address. I heard Scarpa boots are fairly soft. I have them right now, but I'm an Alpine racer. So I'm just a bit concerned that it might be too soft when going downhill. Any suggestions or thoughts? Yeah, this is one for Larry. <laughs> it's a great question, actually. Uh, I get it a lot, particularly from the people that are ex racers. And of course we have a lot of those in Canada. So. The Scarpa boots, they come in different flex patterns. Uh, so you can get a 110 flex or 100 flex up to a 130 flex. Flex patterns are a guideline. So one brand's 130 flex can be very soft. Technica, for example, versus say uh, a Fisher's 130 was, was extremely stiff. So there are variations. You know, really that's dependent upon foot shape uh, as to what boot might be best for you, whether that's a, a, a Dina fit, for example, the Hoji, very stiff 130 flex that would be more than suitable for what you're looking for. But that's something that we could uh, or should have a discussion with one on one. Thank you. All right, come in and talk to Larry. <laughs> okay, uh, let's go here. I got a question. How you guys, how are you guys so awesome? See you on the mountain. Oh, well, that's, <laughs> that's a good one. Love it. Yippee. Okay. Last question. Can we rent the full kit of everything needed for a day in the backcountry? skis with bindings, boots, transceiver, shovel, probe, etc. And is that discounted with our code? And if so, about how much would that be? Most definitely. 
You can rent absolutely everything you need from us to get out in the back country. And that even goes beyond what you've listed. It includes you, backpacks too. You bet. And backpacks, it includes sleeping bags, sleeping mats, tents if you want to do winter camp, uh, camping, pots, stoves, uh, your, uh, gosh, the list goes on and on and on. So in regards to uh, costing, it depends a little bit. There are variations because of you know, what type of uh, gear you're actually renting. Our, our ski products, if you want to take out some of our DPS skis, you know, they're very, uh, you know, that's an expensive ski. You know, retail, it's you know, $1,500. And that's reflected in the uh, pricing. But you should easily be able to get out uh, with a full package uh, you know, for just over 120 bucks. Uh, and that includes everything for you. Awesome. Okay. So I really, really appreciate all of you guys. Whoa, what's this? Okay. 25%. Oh, right. Oh, this is the best part. I forgot about this. Okay. So we have some giveaways today. Um, we're going to start with the shovel. Now, which shovel are we giving away? Black, diamond. We'll figure it out. Okay, so we're giving away a shovel. We've done a random generator and the uh, EVAC seven. So that's black diamond. Um, so the winner of the shovel today is Mike Vert. So Woo! Mike, thank you for tuning in. That's awesome. Um, how are we gonna get, what this, should they do to contact us? Uh, just, uh, we'll, we'll get a hold of you. We got your email, don't worry about it. Yeah. All right, um, number two, the probe. I'm guessing that's a black diamond probe as well. Oh, Stephanie, Stephanie LeBlanc. You've won a probe tonight. And uh, I would say the big ticket item, no offense. The big ticket item is we're giving away an AST course tonight. Um, so everybody that has tuned in, we have checked that you are in fact viewing the presentation. Thank you for doing so. Robin Dodwell, congratulations. You have won an AST1 course. I hope I'm gonna see you in one of my women's courses. <laughs> um, and like I said, guys, keep in mind that on the MSA website, if you do want to book a course with the code ESCAPE15, you can book any of our AVI classes or backcountry courses. Yes, Robin, you're welcome. Um, and so that again, that's ESCAPE15. And then you will receive also 25% off complete rental packages from the ESCAPE route. What's the code for that again? Try touring. Try touring. You'll figure that one out. Okay, so yeah, that's everything that we've kind of gotten through tonight. There's one more thing, one more thing. So this is what I call my coffee table book. This is a bit of inspiration for you guys, okay? So Skiing the Coast Mountains, John Baldwin, all right? He is the man. If you want some ideas, this is a good place to start. Somebody was asking me about technical or expert backcountry terrain. This is where you're going to get some amazing ideas. Books are not dead. Okay, there we go. Do you guys have anything else to say tonight? Oh, MSA code only valid for two weeks. Oh, two weeks? Okay, so I've just been informed that the MSAA code, the 15% off, Escape 15, will only be valid for the next two weeks. Okay, so please get online and book that code, book that course as soon as you can. And again, that's going to be valid for AST1, AST2, whatever course that you're looking to take. Um, we've got some thank yous, some more thank yous. We got some peace signs. All right. Does the 15 apply to private courses? I think so. I'm going to have to double check on that one. I'm going to make that happen. I've got a thumbs up. Okay, the 15% does apply to private courses. And like I said, those are highly, highly encouraged. Okay, um, I think that's it. I'm just going to uh, wrap up and say thank you all very much for uh, tuning in. Uh, the response has been fantastic. Uh, we really appreciate it. I really look forward to seeing all of you people out there in deep powder snow and let there not be a track in front of you. All the best, you guys. Thank you very much. Thank you, April. And of course, thank you to Michelle. She was our tech person uh, in the background, making sure this all works. And uh, you guys have a wonderful evening and a very safe winter tour. Thank you.
Awesome. All right, guys, take care of yourself. I'm sure we haven't addressed all of your questions. So please feel free to get us on our Facebook pages, um, at our info accounts, any way that you can reach us and we'll reach out to us and we'll do everything we can to help you out. Okay. Have a great night. Thanks so much, guys.